This is the Comics Alternative, reviews of DC Comics Before Superman, My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies, and Umbrella Academy, Hotel Oblivion, number one. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Sturge. And we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, we're going to look at three recent titles. We're going to begin with Nikki Wheeler Nicholson's DC Comics Before Superman, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson's Pulp Comics. After that, we're going to look at My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. And then we're going to wrap up with the first issue of Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba's Umbrella Academy Hotel Oblivion. But before we get into that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by those wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be anywhere from 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price, sometimes 50% off cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. That's right, Derek. In fact, if you go right now, you can find My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies, which is one of the books we're talking about, for 40% off. And you can also find future editions of or future issues of Umbrella Academy Hotel Oblivion also for 40% off. So you can and you can also find tr- trades of Umbrella Academy, the past two volumes, so you can catch up. You know, you just can't beat the prices at Discount Comic Book Service if for no other reason Discount is in their name. Go to DCBService.com. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Every bit helps. So how have things been going, Sturge? They're going. It's it's getting cool. That's what's happening yeah. here. It, it, it went from summer to, <laughs> I'm not going to say winter, but. 40 in the morning is, uh, it's, it's brisk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, as we record, I'm sitting with a sweatshirt on, which I haven't put on since back in the, I guess, early spring. Oh yeah. We're, we're, we're scouring the house for where the jackets are for the kids. <laughs> they, they haven't needed them in a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, we should also mention something about our absence from last week. Uh, listeners, dedicated listeners, not listeners who don't give a damn, I guess, but dedicated <laughs> listeners will notice that we didn't have an episode last Wednesday, and there was a reason for that. Um, you know, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you may have heard me say something about having an ill father, uh, someone who for the past two and a half – over that, actually, years – has not been in the best of health. Um, my dad passed, and – the funeral was uh, last week. So needless to say, I was preoccupied with other things outside of the podcast. So while we apologize for not having an episode on last week, uh, I hope everyone understands. Hey, that's one of those things that we all have to deal with in life. So I understand. And I'm, I'm on the podcast. Mm. But life and comics go on. That's right. And 
Speaking of which, let's begin by discussing the first title that we're going to be looking at this week, and that is DC Comics Before Superman, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson's Pulp Comics. And this comes out from Hermes Press, and it is written and curated by Nikki Wheeler Nicholson, the granddaughter of the Major. And so this came out last month, in fact. Uh, We got our hands on a copy and wanted to discuss it because we were fascinated by the topic, you know, what were DC Comics like before Superman, especially given the fact, and Nikki points this out uh, early on in the book, that many of these comics are extremely hard to come by now, Mm -hmm. you know, and and even if they are out there, um, they are worth bukus of money so if if like someone has an early issue of like new fun let's say or an issue of new fun how much is that worth and are they going to let some you know writer or archivist scan it right right that's that's the funny part right yeah mm-hmm. just put it in a put it spread the pages really far apart and put light on them <laughs> But uh, yeah, so uh, this is – I found this a fascinating text, uh, and it surprised me. We were talking about this before we turned on the mics. I think both of us assumed that this would be a book of just comics. You know, yeah, and it's much more than that. Yeah, maybe just an, maybe a written introduction and afterward or something like that. But yeah, it's much more than that. And in fact, what Nikki Wheelerson Nicholson does – and what I'll do is I'll refer to her throughout as Nikki – instead of Wheeler Nicholson, and Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson as the major. Just distinguish the two. Sounds Um, good to me. So so no disrespect to Nikki Wheelerson Nicholson by not referring to her by her last name. But anyway, um, what she does is she provides quite a bit of context, history, and insights into what was going on at the time. So I really appreciated the fact that this book is a combination of comics that she could get her hands on and her own kind of historical overview and context about uh, her grandfather, the period, the relationships that her grandfather had in terms of business, so on and so forth. Oh, yeah. And I – I appreciated that as well. It was one of those things that it it, it kind of made me think about my own work and – a few years ago, I contributed a few chapters to a book called The Icons of the American Comic Book. Mm-hmm. And I wrote a chapter on DC Comics, which was kind of a bear of a chapter to write because I think it's – I had to get 75 years at the time into about 20 pages and all the things that you know DC kind of did first. And I was – it made me – reading this book made me wonder, OK, what did I say about the major? So I went and I found – and basically I have a sentence that says his financial woes. <laughs> yeah, no. His financial woes caused him to bow out of the business early on. He was not there to revel in the success of the first comics <laughs> um, or the debut of Superman in Action Comics number one, which is, according to this book, is, is, is you know, she highlights more of the second part. Um, but, you know, it, what I have is kind of misrepresents, at least according to her account, the first the first half of that sentence. So, you know, that he bowed out of the business really leaves out a lot of major details. Mm hmm. Yeah. And in fact, one of the reasons why Nikki seems to write this book, and, and she's she's honest about this, she comes out mm-hmm. uh, at the beginning and, and says this, is she wants to provide more history uh, mm-hmm. and more context surrounding the reality of her father's relationship with, uh, you know, national publications or DC Comics, you know, leading up to and including the publication of Action Number one, Mm -hmm. Uh, because she wants to, I think, in many ways, combat certain assumptions or histories that we have out there that uh, the major was kind of a minor player in comics, that Mm -hmm. he came from kind of a privileged background, that comics were just a sideline for him, that he wasn't serious about it, uh, that he's the one who left instead of uh you know being maneuvered out mm-hmm. by Donenfeld and Lieberwitz. Um 
and that he really wasn't anything more than a publisher and maybe editor. Uh, but she demonstrates in this book, DC Comics Before Superman, that is definitely not the case. Because all of the comics that are here that are interspersed among the various prose, the historical and contextual pieces that Nikki writes, mm -hmm. are stories that are based on the major's own pulp stories. Yeah, and that's one of the things I appreciated about this book, too, is that, you know, being that he, he authored a lot of these pieces, sometimes under pseudonym, so you wouldn't know it was him. Um, it it kind of shows the bridge of how instrumental he was kind of from bridging those pulp magazines to getting into the comics magazines. And, you know, there's a lot of adventure stories in here and, you know, kind of like exotic locales, you know, like Arabian people and Asiatics, I think he calls them when he's being kind. <laughs> um and, you know, that that kind of flavor of a story, which, you know, I think is a hallmark of those early comic books before the superheroes really, you know, took hold. Um, what I also thought was very interesting is, 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 is the, her descriptions of his business practices and how at least, I don't know, verbally that with the artists and the creators and the writers that he would say things like, well, we co-own these characters. You know, mm -hmm. Like this isn't like, you know, you know. Dr. Occult is not, you know, the same level of Superman in terms of, a, you know, a pro an intellectual property. But um, when Siegel and Schuster had Dr. Occult, it, it, you know, I think that he said, no, you guys own that <laughs> or we own it together. It's not like, you know, it's not going to be mine, which is very drastically different from uh, <laughs> what ends up happening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Much more inclusive when it comes to the artists and writers that he worked with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so not only was he a publisher, he was an editor, he was a writer, he was an artist himself, even though I don't think we see any of his art here. But Nikki does right. point out that there were periods that he did write strips, you know, mm -hmm. previous to becoming a publisher. Um, and he so seemed, he, he oh, had a hand, oh, I was gonna say he had a hand in almost every aspect of mm -hmm. comics from the very beginning. Yeah, and I would say even even finding talent or finding the content or the characters, like it seemed like he was part of that process too. About you know finding people that could make these comics or we would have characters kind of in hand that he could publish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. He, he was even an adapter, taking classic texts mm -hmm. like um, you know Walter Scott was one of the fa his favorites, and uh, bringing those to comics or at least Walter Scott inspired narratives to comics. Mm -hmm. Or she that. She, yeah, she is an example of one of those. That's one of mm -hmm. the comics that we have in here, or at least a portion of. And by the way, we should mention that with, I think about all of these stories, all of the comic stories that we have here, the serials, um, they're incomplete. Either we don't have something toward the very beginning or toward the end. Mm -hmm. It's just that, as as Nikki states, she couldn't get her hands on it, and these comics are extremely hard to find, and she couldn't track them down. Right. I think the only thing that we have the complete version of is Blood Pearls. Blood it only Pearls. ran over I think it only ran over two issues. Okay. So that one's that one that one we have all of. But yeah, there's a lot yeah. I, I kind of don't know how the, you don't know how the care. It's like a cliffhanger. It's like the serials. You know, it's like every episode is like they're tied up and this is going to happen to them and then you don't get a lot of resolution about that in this book. Yeah. You just have to have faith that they get they get through it somehow. And the thing about Blood Pearls, uh, that that struck me as a story that stood out, and not just mm -hmm. because it's complete, but in terms of the art, mm -hmm. and also in terms of the illustrative style. Uh, out, you know, outside of, or I, I guess the layout, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are occasions where we have in certain panels unconventional from you know what we have grown accustomed to in comics right. um relationship between image and text such as word balloons and whatnot and sound effects uh sometimes things are laid out at what we may call unusual angles but keep in mind this is the early days of comics so right. it's still at the stage a stage of defining itself. And so these were no more unusual than any other kind of layout or arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what struck me too is, you know, a lot of these comics that, that to me, blood pearls is actually the, the standout for me too, in this book. It was one of those, 
just the narrative it just it kind of caught me in a way that the other ones it didn't seem as derivative and i don't mean it in a bad way it's just kind of like you said feeling the way through what comics were and kind of defining it and we're you know we, we sit in a place where this is 80 years ago so we can kind of we know kind of where things are going so when we look at the beginnings and you know for me anyway i read it and it's beautiful like it's it's well rendered but there's a part of me that's like okay this is uh they're doing like a hal foster kind of prince valiant layout or art style it's just the comics are much different in terms of narrative Mm -hmm. um you know but but the artwork looks like that kind of it it smacks of that to me at least the first uh the first serial not serial series i guess but that blood pearls one is definitely laid out differently and i like that i mean they kind of led a lot of these well, Blood Pearls, especially some of the later ones, I liked how they led readers through which panels to read. Like they're all numbered. The panels are numbered so that you kind of right. know what sequence to go in. Like, like you know, like like training wheel comics to kind of get you knowing where you have to go. Exactly. Or it, I guess, you know, from as you pointed out, from our vantage point over 80 years later now, mm-hmm. um, we may call them something like training wheels. But, you know, at the time. When we didn't have many comics laid out in this way, I mean, people right. were used to comic strips. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is different. So, especially when you have a series of panels that aren't, let's say, angular mm-hmm. and aren't arranged in, you know, something like a, you know, a, a nine panel or twelve panel grid or anything like that. You know, where does a reader go? You know, especially when you have action in one panel seeming to lead to the next panel, even though that's not the next one we should read. And Mm -hmm. so it makes sense that early on in the game when it comes to comic books that you would number the panels in ways to kind of instruct the reader. You go here, then you go here, then you go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's – that's definitely, I think, one of the things I noticed about the book, too. It, it kind of gets more experimental the farther it goes along, mm-hmm. too, I think, and which, you know, I, I think speaks to kind of people feeling out the genre, not the genre, but the format and, you know, learning how to tell stories uh, on the page rather than, you know, a strip form. Yeah, I think that if you compare something like Barry O'Neill and, you know, the Fang, Fang Gao of China, which I want to mm-hmm. talk about to something like Bob Merritt, which is, I guess, somewhat similar, and then mm-hmm. compare those two to something like what we were talking about, Blood Pearls, uh, right. The Golden Dragon, Monastery of the Blue God, you're going to find a difference in oh, yeah. layout and, if, if we want to call it this, maybe more of a maturity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely, or an experimentation even with kind of panel sizes and, mm-hmm. and the flow and, you know, the way the action is is more, more of a fl- flexibility in terms of form, right? And it, it it kind of has more comic convention stuff to it, like the early ones. Like I said, that's like Hal Foster kind of things. Which I don't know if I'm just this is what I I think of, but they're they're good storytelling in a way. But the images are more like gorgeously depicted illustrations than they are action like comics to me. And I get that, that, you know, there's a line in there somewhere where it's, it actually is all comics, but I think the rendering held, holds more of a, like a, a, a primal place in the early comics. And then later on, it's more like the storytelling. That's, that's kind of how I, 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 what I kind of noticed in the comics. Yeah. Well, which other ones stood out for you in addition to blood pearls? Um, well, you mentioned the Barry O'Neill one, which, that one stood out to me mostly because I think it's the most substantial one. It's, yeah, it's the, the longest. longest one that we have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, the you know, this adventure strip with lots of cliffhangers. And I think it was like two page episodes, basically, that, that ran in certain issues. And then. Yeah. Um, and, and I liked I, I appreciated how, how uh, Nikki kind of described it. You know, it is kind I mean, if you read it now, I mean, it's it's very racist towards uh, Chinese people. Um, (laughs) But she does admit that it's it's equally offensive to French readers who are represented with these horrible accents. Oh, yeah. What Inspector Legrand? (laughs) That's right. Who, you know, it's like you need a key to kind of understand. It helped me to read it out loud. to know kind of what he was saying all the time. He's always like, come, Jean, the cab is is ready. (laughs) 
Yeah. You will you will be home safe again in the morning. <laughs> Thanks to Barry. <laughs> <laughs> It's the like, whole street is blown up, or the ro- volcano it is terrible. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> like French people don't sound like that. <laughs> I don't think. No, they don't. They don't. And uh, Chinese people don't look like <laughs> they look like in this book. I mean, they're all like you know, kind of in that Fu Manchu kind of mode, or they're either Fu Manchu or kind of those kind of inhuman monsters with, you know, they don't have, I don't think they have fangs, but they might as well have fangs. Yeah. And in fact, I was really struck when we were first introduced in this story to the figure of Fang Gao, because mm-hmm. he's in the background for the first, what, however many pages. And right. then, uh, in the book, I think it's page 45, uh, both Barry and the inspector come across Fang Gao and they mm-hmm. first, they see him, they're looking at him in the face, and we see him from behind. This is the penultimate panel on that page. And mm-hmm. then the last one, we see a close-up of Fang Gao. You know, so, Barry O'Neill, I have been looking forward to this meeting for a long time. Now, thankfully, he doesn't speak in some kind of, uh, you yeah. know, <laughs> stereotypical Chinese mm-hmm. patois. But, uh, but he does look very stereotypical and downright oh, yeah. scary. But he's supposed oh, yeah. to be scary. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the irony. Is like everybody else has this horrible uh, dialogue, but his is crystal clear. He knows. Mm-hmm. He knows. It's like he knows the Queen's English. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, th- there are occasions. And it's not only in uh, Barry O'Neill and Feng Gao of China, but there mm-hmm. are other stories as well where the artists. Engage in certain stereotypes, I guess, is the nicest mm-hmm. way of putting it. Um, uh, you know, another one of these is, you know, blood pearls is is bad, especially when it comes to Filipinos. Not not right. so much Chinese, but Filipinos. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there are other stories as well where there are a good number of stereotypes being engaged in. But they're called Asiatics in that story, so that makes it better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, and that, that's – just to go back to Barry O'Neill, there's one sympathetic Chinese character who Barry does not remember but <laughs> helped him – he helped him once in San Francisco at some point, survived – Ling Fu, who speaks – I think he's got the thick, the thickest uh, accent out of everybody. His I had to read lots of different times. I mean because it's all those transposed R's and L's and I'm like, what yeah. the heck does that say? You know, it's just uh, – he can't even say forget. He says flow get <laughs> me, me, on page nine. Me trusted watchdog, not flow get you savvy, miserable life one climb. <laughs> so he, yeah, it's it's like it, there's letters where they don't belong. And I'm like, you lived in San Francisco, buddy. You should be able to speak better than that. Or, yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah, but he's the sympathetic character. That's the, the part where <laughs> he's the guy who's on Barry's side. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's I also get it's easy to kind of laugh at the conventions of the I mean, it's it's also kind of horrific. Um, yeah. And, well, you know, another stereotype is that it's the villains who are either Chinese, Filipino, in other words, right. you know, the largely speaking, the Asian other. Exactly. Um, the exotic one. That's, yeah, yeah, the exotics, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But again, I mean, you take these comics within the context of their times. Right. And I mean, in some ways, they're even though they're depicted that way, I mean, in the Blood Pearls, not to not to uh, give away too much about it to those who want to read it. But uh, the, the the Chinese characters are actually the heroes. The the white the white fella this is his name. Baslin is uh, he's a villain. I mean, he's a he's a murderer who is who's killed people to steal these pearls. <laughs> and, you know, that to me is kind of different too i think that was part of what made that story stand out to me is that the, the narrative was cast in a much different way just to, uh, who the protagonist was you know the other ones are more you know kind of traditional like in the spirit of like a you know like an adventure comic where you know we're following our hero go through things and kind of deal with adversity uh, whereas that one it's like uh the protagonist is dealing with adversity but it's adversity that he's created by murdering somebody and stealing pearls <laughs> right so that's it's a, it's kind of a different 
and he's, you don't. And he's the protagonist of the story. Or ba- Baselin is the protagonist of the story. Mm-hmm. Which is much different. And the other ones are more like, I mean, some of the later ones are more like these travel stories where it's just like adventures in exotic places like yeah. the Golden Dragon and uh, the, mon- what's it, the Blue Monastery. Blue Monastery. You know, one of the things coming back to to um, depictions of Chineseness, I guess, and um, uh, uh, blood pearls. If you look on page, what is it one one sixty eight? When we're first introduced to the father, um, what's his name? Um, Cao Chung. So- Cao Chung. Cao Chung. Um, the way he's described in the box in panel 17, it says, Tao Chung's voice is deep, yet bell-like. His face high-bred, and he has kind of a Caucasian-looking face to a large degree. Mm-hmm. Except for he's straight yellow in the coloring. Yeah, yeah. Like like John. And his daughter is very pink and Caucasian-looking. Mm-hmm. The, the Mez, Mestiza? Mestiza, yeah. Mestiza. As which she's called. Yeah. Which I don't know. Does that mean that she's mixed? I mean, I thought that was a uh, like a like more of a Latino thing. Apparently, it, just- it can mean you know mixed in other contexts and other cultures. Mm. I guess. Yeah, because she's she's the the desired one. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, that's the price for the, uh, the. Well, he wants to trade the pearls at first. The guy's like, "You need to bring me a mestiza, a highborn mestiza lady." <laughs> Which. Yeah. This guy, Baslin is he is all too. I mean, he's he's a he's kind of a he's a shady is kind of an understatement. He's all too. He's like, yeah, I'll trade you whatever. Yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, sure. And I'm gonna double cross you. Mm. But yeah, that's. I don't know. That's it's it's important. I think that we get kind of. I know it's a controversial thing um, talking about kind of depictions in the past. Um, I think it's important to remember what they're what they're what they were like i guess right you know it, it, my feeling about this is to point out and become aware of mm-hmm. those stereotypes embedded in the various narratives whether it be in on the textual level or the the, the illustrative level mm-hmm. while at the same time not letting that hang up any appreciation or potential appreciation let's say uh, mm-hmm. Or critical reading of the text, yeah, although that can be a part of the critical reading of the text, of course. Right. I don't want to sell it. Yeah, it's not something to be celebrated, but it's something I think it's important to acknowledge. It's there, and mm-hmm. you know, it's part of the history. And I'm, I'm thinking of a book like, uh, what Jean Yang and um, what's that? The Green Dragon? No, the Green. No, the Green Turtle book. Green I don't Turtle. know if you had read that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. About you know the the first. Chinese superhero who you never saw his face because the the publisher didn't want to acknowledge that he was Chinese. So the exactly. artist just drew him from the back all the time. Um, and in fact, we had Sonny Liu on the show to talk about that. That's book right. That Sonny Liu out. drew that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And that's that, you know, I, I think about that kind of book, which comes out much later as kind of a response to all these depictions, which are, you know, very stereotypical. And, you know, I think even well-meaning in times like, you know, some of these characters are supposed to be heroic. Um, but they're just not, I mean, in contemporary form, you look at them, you're like, eh, it's still a stereotype or, you know, they're still not on equal pot footing with the, you know, the white protagonist, whoever that is, mm-hmm. even if they're a villain. Yeah. Like Baslin. Yeah. Yeah. Although, well, I won't spoil it, but mm. you know, you, villains don't usually prosper in early right. comic books. Right. Um, okay. So what did you think of the Bob Merritt that, I there was a point where I was really into Airboy in the the early eighties, which uh-huh. I know sounds weird, I, but there was that series that um, Chuck Dixon wrote that came out from Eclipse Comics, and uh, Tim Truman drew, drew it at the beginning, and I I liked that book, and so part of that they kind of reprinted the uh, the old Airboy comics that I think Hillman published in the forties around World War Two, and they're they're kind of like this too, you know they're. They're kind of racists, um, 
well, not even kind of, they're racist, <laughs> um, about, <laughs> you, and, except for they're the targets, Japanese people or Koreans later on. That struck me kind of like the same kind of story, which led me to wonder whether or not uh, the Hillman people kind of ripped this off because it's kind of like an aviator who's got like a special plane. Mm-hmm. Um, in that case, you know, Airboy has birdie, which the, f- the plane flaps its wings like a bird. And this one, it's <laughs> kind of like, yeah, which doesn't sound practical at all to me. It's like, well, that sounds like it's got a lot more chance to break down and not work. Um, but this one, he's, he's, he flies what it's, it's a red plane. That's called the bumblebee. <laughs> that's got really stubby wings. And I think the plane looks maneuverable. cool. Oh, it looks cool, but it's, it looks like a, it looks kind of like a Studebaker with a, with a propeller on the front. <laughs> so, you know, or it looks like a fuselage, maybe like it's like one jet engine with a propeller. Yeah. But it's not, you know, it's, it's that kind of like, they got a special plane and although it's much different, it's not war. It's more like a what the, the treasure. It's like a treasure adventure, I guess, where they're trying to get. A, a treasure, but they run into yeah, they're, misadventures. They're in Alaska, and there is a gold mine. Mm-hmm. And what it, it, the guy named Jake has the mine, but they're trying That's to right. find it. And then uh, one of them, I can't remember, but a younger member of Merritt's crew accidentally, you know, in trying to escape, yeah, um, being kidnapped, uh, stumbles upon the gold load. And of course, who has it? It's the Chinese. Mm-hmm. They're they're Asiatic. They're Asiatics. Okay. The Asiatics have it, yeah. They're silent, too. They don't talk, but they have really big swords. <laughs> and chopping blocks. Speak softly and carry a big sword. That's right. It's that kind of book. Although, the little guy gets his comeuppance against them when when things come down. What is his name? Dickie. Of course, it's Dickie. Dickie. Little Dickie. Well, how about the Golden Dragon? What are your thoughts of that story? And that's a later one. That was a later one. I'm looking at that one. Is that the? Is that the auto? No, that's the. The one that kind of struck me was the Monastery of the Blue God one, just because it had a whole bunch of autobiographical elements to it, and I think his wife is is the heroine in it. Yeah, that's one of the things that Nikki points out is that it, it, he basically incorporated his own life or his own relationship with his mm-hmm. wife. Oh, what was her name? Um, Elsa is with Elsa. Elsa, Elsa yeah. B- uh, Bjorsborn. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah, I probably butchered her last name. She's, I guess, Swedish. But mm-hmm. yeah, the Monastery of the Blue God was was an interesting one. Yeah, I like that one. I mean, I liked I liked all of them for kind of their for different for reasons. Their work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trying to find the Blue Monastery one. That's the one. Oh no, not the the Golden Dragon. That's the the later one. Right. That's the later one. That's with the one a, where you have the three guys, and I can't remember their names. Mm-hmm. Uh, they hire Cossacks. That's right. To to guard them once they get off the train, and Never then it takes place in what? Yeah, but then Mon- they're in Mon- It takes place in Mongolia, right? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. right. And they get rescued by uh, by a, a good Chinese fellow. Dan Chi Dan Chi Lu. He's there, and he looks. Uh, I, I. This is one of the ones that I had a harder time following. If you want the truth? <laughs> <laughs> what um, you mean the storyline? Yeah, yeah. It just seemed like they were behind enemy lines, and then just things kept happening. It was just more and more misadventures. Like they just kept running afoul of people, and um, that one wasn't as coherent to me. Or maybe I wasn't as coherent when I was reading it. That's that might be more the case. Well, it's toward the end of the book. Maybe you had uh, book fatigue by that point. Book fatigue, yeah. <laughs> I I I like the. I mean, I like the illustrations through all this stuff. That's one of the mm-hmm. things that kind of uh, Golden Age comics for me are one of those things that, like you said, it's it's kind of when the conventions were getting laid down, and the artwork in them to me is it's hit or miss in general. Cause sometimes it gets really muddy and it's hard to make out. Um, but it seems like the major worked with very talented artists mm-hmm. that, that, that were in general, you know, maybe groundbreaking. Uh, I mean, honestly, because they were kind of laying the, the, the groundwork for what comics would be. Exactly. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's evidence that, 
he wasn't a he wasn't an idiot in terms of recognizing and hiring talent <laughs> to me. Like the the art the art is across the board. I appreciate it. Um, I like things more like that uh, Fo with the Borgias story just because the panels are much larger and the art is it, it gets to breathe a little bit more. I'm not saying that the story was you know fascinating because it's basically like guys uh, dying uniforms and fighting other guys that are trying to pillage their city. <laughs> uh, so it's not like the most complicated narrative, but it's got sword play and lots of like cool costumes. Um, but the panels are big, which yeah, definitely th- helps me. I think that that's one of the things about the golden age comics is that, that they, there's a lot on the page, which is cool in a way. It, it lets a lot happen. Yeah. In, in terms of the story. Let's you feel like you get more, for, more bang for your buck. Right, which was a thing in early comics. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like competition. Like, okay, you couldn't, you know, you didn't want to spend your 10 cents and be done in 10 minutes. You wanted to be able to sit down with this thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and in addition to what you were referring to, the original artwork, mm-hmm. uh, I think the reproduction of the artwork that we have in this book, DC Comics Before Superman, is really good. You know, because okay. sometimes with books like this, I've noticed the reproductions, not that they're blurry, but they just don't seem as crisp as they could be or they should right. be. Um, in this book, I think that uh, Nikki did a great job mm-hmm. at reproducing the art that she could find. Yeah, and sometimes the colors seem wonky because it, the, you know these were things originally for newsprint, not for the glossy paper that's in this book. Right. So I think it – Across the board, like you said, the artwork is is crisp, and I, I appreciate the coloring. Like it's not sometimes it comes off as garish. I mean, it's vibrant. It's not you know, it's not like muted coloring, but uh, I think it works. It doesn't look overly rendered. It doesn't look you know like uh, like some kid took Crayola crayons to it or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, which I I thought it was good in, yeah. in general. And in addition to the various comics, most of which we've been talking about, uh, I, I think in our discussion of DC before Superman, there are a variety, I mean, many, many covers that Nikki includes, as well as mm-hmm. photographs and other contextual images. So this is a book that is image heavy and not just in terms of the comics. I think primarily the comics, of course, but not mm-hmm. just the comics. Yeah, and I like seeing all those. The, the pulp issues like before you know the pre-comics pulp kind of things those are cool and i like seeing even just the, the covers for for new new uh was it new fun and more fun yeah you know, those are one of those that, like I, I know i've mentioned before you know when i was a kid it was you go through the overstreet price guide and it's like oh my god it's like this weird you know rosetta stone for these texts or something like that and it's really cool to actually see the covers that Usually I just see them described like I'm not going to have much chance to see, you know, some early new adventure comics, Um, but it's really cool to see the covers and kind of recognize, you know, where where the comic book industry came from. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you mentioned the pulps. One of the things I really appreciated about this book, and we get this at the very beginning, is Nikki is setting a context. Mm -hmm. She gives a chapter with a brief overview of basically a biography of her grandfather, the major. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he, in fact, he was, as she points out, seems to have been um, kind of manhandled or mistreated, so to speak. And the military, he eventually left. Uh, And then he got into publishing and it's his experiences first as a writer. And then, um, you know, working with pulps that, um, I think set the stage for his work as a publisher in comics. And so yeah. we, we get a lot of that background. And of course, you know, any, any student of comics knows that early comics, especially, or well, even comics today are heavily informed by the pulps that came before them. But I think that it's worth underscoring this in this book, especially given the fact that major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson is the subject to mm-hmm. a large degree. Yeah. And I, I like that, you know, there, there was a part of me that was like, Oh, there's, there's prose in here and history, which, you know, I was like, I wanted, I thought it was going to be all comics, but I was really fascinated and in getting that kind of background that you just mentioned and, you know, seeing the history and the transition and actually 
this is a small amount about his life um, relatively because I think later on in the book it says that she's working on a you know a more uh, large substantive biography of the major um, but just to, to kind of get all these little artifacts too from the pulps to even like the early Siegel and Schuster like the, the Superman layout for the, the newspaper strip or you know their fanzine page early on where you know that first villainous version of Superman mm-hmm. um, and just I don't know there's there's a lot in this book that I think if you're a student of the history of comics there's a lot for you here um, right. to kind of digest and you know she also toward the end of the book and I think we we hinted at this earlier it's worth mentioning again um, she's suggesting that contrary to what most historians have said mm-hmm. that the major had quite a heavy hand in bringing Superman to comics. Right. And in fact, according to testimony by, let's say, family members. Now, mm-hmm. granted, there's the potential for bias there. Sure. Um, but supposedly, this is something that the major talked with family members about, getting their opinion on the first Superman installment. I mean, mm-hmm. he was definitely aware of this, and he planned on including it in the first issue of Action. Right. Um, maybe not featuring Superman on the cover, because we have, uh, what, a cover, and I can't remember what page that's on. It's toward the back of the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he went to oh, the right. patent office. right, the Ashcan. Yeah, that's right, yeah, the Ashcan cover. When he went to the patent office, we don't mm-hmm. have that typical, you know, Superman with a car above his head. We have right. some sinister-looking guy, you know, looking over his shoulder at us, the reader, with a knife in his hand. Mm-hmm. You know, blood dripping off of it. I get, yeah, I assume that that's blood, not... Uh, it's not Water carving a pumpkin. Or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or orange juice or anything like that. But mm-hmm. um, but he had planned on including Superman in that first issue of action. It's mm-hmm. just that he really wasn't able to reap the benefits of that because of the financial maneuverings of Donenfeld and Lieberwitz. Yeah. And that's one of the things I think, you know, I, I, I tried to talk a lot about the early days of comics, or at least to some extent when I teach, I have a freshman seminar about comics and superheroes and I, you know, they don't know about comics and, you know, I try to impress on them kind of how nobody knew any of this was going to be worth anything at the point. It was just kind of like a business venture. And I think about, you know, reading this and kind of the, the behind the scenes kind of issues. I mean, in hindsight, it ends up being a huge deal because Superman ends up being, you know, kind of a watershed character that, you know, influences everything and makes lots of people fortunes. Um, so in that sense, you know, we look at it in hindsight and we're like, man, the major just got screwed. And, you know, it's easy to look at him as kind of like a rube or something like that. But I like how she cast it in a way, which, you know, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle ground. You know, he probably wasn't a rube, but I like how she described him kind of as he didn't have the legal expertise that these other, these other guys had been around the block in terms of fleecing people or having companies or maybe fleecing is, is, you know, a biased way of talking about it, but they had done something similar to other people who had money and right. were able to publish things. Yeah. And the major just kind of ran into that lawnmower. Exactly. And then he, not that he was innocent in any way. I mean, you know, right. this is a guy who, who had quite a bit of business experience mm-hmm. within the field of publishing, but I mean, he did have he he brought a sense of honor given his military background. That's something that Don and Felt definitely right. did not have. Right, and you know, a willingness to be open. I mean, it's one of those things that you know, it's one of those you look back at and you go, "What could have been if you know if comics were creator owned from the get go? That would have been you know, I think the entire history of the medium would be different um, instead of you know, basically." Things end up, I mean, at least in America, where, you know, things end up being kind of like superheroes uh, for 30 years, uh, being the dominant, you know, narrative, just because that's what the two big companies, uh, that was their bread and butter. You know, if, if things were creator owned at the get go, I mean, who knows what would have happened, mm-hmm. you know, if we had image back then, <laughs> or, you know. <laughs> Sir 
George, you want to move on to the second text that we're going to be looking at for this week? Sure. And that is speaking my, of image. <laughs> speaking of image, yeah, I thought that was a good transition point. Hey. Uh, my heroes have always been junkies, mm-hmm. not cowboys. No. Uh, by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, and this is a criminal story. And in fact, I found it curious, and I'm I'm wondering what you thought of this as well. That this wasn't called criminal. Mm-hmm. My heroes have always been junkies. Instead of just my heroes have always been junkies. And then you open it up and you get to, I don't know, like the fifth page or something Mm -hmm. in the title page. It says a criminal novella by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. Well, I think it's clever in a way because they're trying to sell sell a book to somebody who might not be like, oh, volume seven. I I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to buy volume seven without having read the first six. Well, they don't have to call it volume seven. They can call it criminal. My heroes have always been junkies. But I mean, it's a criminal's narrative without being overtly billed as one. And I think it would honestly, I think it tips the contents of the book. Because the way it twists at some point, like if you know it overtly, it's a criminal story. You're kind of waiting for certain aspects of the story to happen because the criminal series is more like a noir series. And you know that uh, people are always going to have uh, self-motivated <laughs> actions and they're going to double cross people and they're going to try to just they all, I mean, I love the criminal series, but they're like, you know, some of the worst people. Yeah. Have you read all the criminal series up to this I have. Point? I have. And I'd forgotten that was one of the kickers is that I'd, you know, it's been a while. So when certain characters do pop up later in the book, I was like, oh, like, it, you know, all these little things started going off. But, you know, I, I think it works even if you don't know who they are, though. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I've read all of the criminal series except for, I guess, the last, the the special one shot, uh, Mm -hmm. wrong place, wrong, wrong time, wrong place. Mm -hmm. Up to that, I I read Coward, Lawless, The Dead and the Dying, Bad Night, The Sinners, The Last of the Innocent. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had not read Wrong Time, Wrong Place. Was that the one that was two magazines? Like I think he had published two magazine size yeah, comics. Yeah, that's what that was. Yeah, um, and I really do enjoy. Uh, first off, first and foremost, the collaborative team of Brubaker and Phillips, but especially yeah. what they do in Criminal. I mean, I like their other stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I liked. Well, you, you know, I actually I didn't read all of Fatal. I need to finish that. Okay, but I appreciated that. Um, mm-hmm. What was the last one? Or, um, the Fade Out. No, no, they're doing Killer Be Killed. That's Killer ongoing. Be Killed, yeah. And I think that that's going to be wrapping up soon, right? That's going to be a TV show too, I think. Oh, it is? Somebody somebody, is, yeah. somebody has bought that and is developing it for TV. And then the Fade Out. You know, I, I, I as much as I liked Fatal and at least the first part of Killer Be Killed, mm-hmm. I like their straight crime yeah. Better than I do the crime mixed with the supernatural or the horror. Or the genre stuff. Like Incognito is more like superhero y or sleeper. I liked sleeper. Yeah. But that was the first thing I think of. Well, I'd read uh whatever that they had a they had a prior book that was it wasn't criminal, the big ripoff or something like that. Um but yeah, I, I agree with you though. I think criminal kind of to me reads like I mean, I think they, they put a lot of love and care into their comics. Uh, even though they're about horrible people, they, they love <laughs> those kinds of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and definitely, you know, they, they to me, the, you know, they love noir books in general, right. I think. And that really comes out in criminal, like just the conventions of those things come across. Uh, it's more like, like you said, it's like undiluted. Like the other ones have like little genre things kind of, you know, tinting the, the noir story. Like, you know, they're superheroes, but, you know, it's like a villain in a super villain in witness protection or it's, uh, you know, some kind of Lovecraftian horror monster thing in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the the fade out was more noirish. It just I think had a whole lot more. It was specifically situated in uh, what the movie industry. Right. And, exactly. Like, so it, it was a little different. The criminal are just 
they're just seedy people. Yeah, exactly. And you know, like you, it has been a long time since I've read Criminal, mm-hmm. so I didn't know if certain characters or references to figures were in previous volumes of Criminal. So, for instance. When Ellie, our protagonist, or at least mm-hmm. the name she's going by here, Ellie, I don't want right. to tip, you know, give anything away here, but when Ellie mentions something about being raised by Jake, yeah, I couldn't help but wonder, is this Jake Brown? It is. Yeah. And I assume it is. so. I use Wikipedia. I cheated. I was like, <laughs> I looked up criminal and I was like, major characters. And I mean, I remember, you know, I know, I know who Teague is because Teague is you know, in the first series Deep and has popped yeah. up, right. He's, he's appeared multiple times. Mm-hmm. So seeing him, I was like, okay, Jake, I had to look up cause he was in the, he was the protagonist of, uh, I forget which book, but like one of the later books, the sinners, maybe. Uh, I can't remember. Or bad night. Maybe it was bad night. The sinners is the one I think that looks like Archie. <laughs> well, you There's, know, that's, that's the thing I really enjoy and, and appreciate about the criminal series is that it's a shared universe. And mm-hmm. to make a literary reference, it's like uh, Faulkner's Jacques de Patoffa County. Right. So a character that is minor and maybe even mentioned in passing in one narrative mm-hmm. becomes a protagonist in another. Yeah. And I, I thought it was, and the, they're different takes on them. So they, they get to grow and develop. Like we've met Ellie before, but she was much younger mm-hmm. uh, when where we saw we her. Again, it's been a long time since I've read them. And where was Ellie? She is the the woman that Teague defends her honor. I will say it that way. And I think uh, that's her daughter, her little, her little daughter is Ellie, but her name's not Ellie in that book. I'm tipping too many things. I, and I can't. Part of why he does what he does is because he's in love. It's like this uh, un- unattainable woman that he can't have. Yeah. And she's got a daughter, and that daughter is Ellie, who at the time you kind of read it. Or, I mean, I read it and I was like, oh, she's this sweet, innocent little child who's going to grow up and, you know, have a chance in life because Teague did these things for her. <laughs> so. I'm not going to say anything else past Little that. Little did he know, yeah. Yeah. You know, if, if nothing else, reading My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies has had me wanting to fish out my packed away Brubaker mm-hmm. and Phillips narratives, criminal and otherwise. Mm-hmm. But yeah. they're in boxes, and I'm just too lazy to go through them right now. And I agree with you. There, there you know, there's, there's not a lot of creators that I will just buy their things with, without even knowing what it's going to be. And right. these two are one. I mean, and it's kind of impressive to me that they've been collaborating as long as they have and putting out, you know, as much consistently excellent work. It's just mm-hmm. one of those things that I love their comics in general. And even the things that aren't, you know, quite, you know, up to the, at least the way I take them, you know, not as good as maybe some other works. Like you said, like Fatale, I really liked um, the fade out I liked, but I wasn't, as taken with um i started killer be killed but i haven't i haven't followed up with i, I read the first trade but not more than that um, honestly for killer be killed i'm waiting for deluxe editions see and that's because we've gotten deluxe editions for the other stuff that they've done yeah and that's going to be a tv like i said i think it's going to be a tv show so you know that's going to be you know I mean, you might get a super deluxe edition of that. Yeah. what network um it's a good question i want to say fx is what i want to say but i'll I'll do some Googling in a bit. I'll, I'll, I'll remember things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll remember. I'm doing air quotes. Air quotes don't work on podcasts. <laughs> yeah, unless they're video podcasts. Unfortunately, That's right. we don't have one of those. Okay. So without giving too much away, I'm not going to give away any spoilers. Uh, the basic storyline of my heroes have always been junkies. We have is the protagonist, the aforementioned Ellie, and she is a drug addict and not just any drug addict, but one who kind of revels mm-hmm. in being a junkie. And that's where the title comes from. As she tells us more than once in the story or tells different people more, uh, and but we read it more than once, uh, many of the heroes – in her life have been junkies like Marilyn Monroe, Mm -hmm. like Judy Garland, you know, like Graham Parsons, right. Uh, You know, people who, who Vic Chestnut, that's, that's more obscure to, to, yeah, we get a reference to Vic Chestnut at the very beginning of the, of the book um, Mm -hmm. or this novella. So 
she is we see her at the very beginning or at least after the initial set up at the beach you know mm-hmm. that, that kind of stands outside of time that kind of like introduces her character in many ways right but then we get in the story proper her at kind of an upscale rehab facility mm-hmm. and so she's there with a lot of people she's skeptical she knows she needs to be there um she doesn't take it seriously uh one of the people who's also there at the rehab is skip a young mm-hmm. man named skip who does take it much more seriously than Ellie does. Um, Ellie starts to pay more attention to Skip. They inadvertently, according to her, develop a relationship. Uh, Eventually, she convinces him to just run off. Mm -hmm. And so they steal a car from one of the employees there and go. And so then you have the – it's kind of like the trope, the two young lovers – on the run, right. doing what they can, right? So stealing, mm-hmm. doing, uh, you know, heisting cars, um, you know, getting drugs in a in a uh, drugstore, things of that sort, doing what they can until they end up meeting their fate. And we don't want to say what that is, which gives a whole new spin on why Ellie is where she is. Mm-hmm. And why she does what she does in terms of becoming associated with Skip. Yeah, and that's one of the things that kind of struck me is that almost nobody – there's lots of – you know, a good book like this has lots of like little red herrings in it. And, you know, it kind of starts out – or not maybe not red herrings, but, you know, foreshadowing and, and, you know, kind of throwing some things out. And it starts out like when they're in group therapy – they talk, there's a lot of exposition about this one guy who's there, not because he's a junkie, but because he got caught uh, messing around on his wife and he made up this elaborate no, lie. He, he gambled. No, no, no. no, no. Was it. Yeah. Oh, he went to strip clubs. He lost That's money at was. strip clubs. Yeah. That's what it was. So he was doing that. And so he, he had to come up with this elaborate story about, you know, what, why he's hooked on drugs and how that is where all the money went. And he's really just kind of going through the motions of being in group therapy or being committed to this place just so that his wife doesn't know. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of get this whole like subterfuge kind of thing. And then, you know, it's like you said, it's like, you know, the young people are like, you know, Ellie's a bad influence and she likes sneaking out and, you know, and skip is trying to actually clean up and, you know, but she's got a gravitational feel as these stories often do, you know? Um, and he trusts her and, you know, like you said, they go out on the lamb and then, I always say complications happen. Mm -hmm. And in her narration, and there's a lot of narration from her throughout this narrative Mm -hmm. um, where she will speak to the reader directly. And there we don't have near as much, if any, subterfuge. But she does call herself more than once a bad influence. Oh, yeah. But there's also kind of this – she doesn't misrepresent herself, but she's uh, – the, the the five dollar word for it is she's prevaricating. Yeah, she said she's not providing a lot of uh, she's not providing a lot of context for Complete her actual, information. Yes, yeah. she's she's she gives you a lot of info, but it's not the whole story. Mm-hmm. So, but she does come across as a classic femme fatale. Speaking mm-hmm. of noir, oh, yeah. um, you know she you know as you mentioned prevaricates. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has some ulterior motives that we aren't aware of at first, especially. Uh, she is highly attractive. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I was struck throughout this narrative by her really thick, pouty lips. Oh, yeah. She's a Venus flytrap. That's what yeah. all these stories. There's a Venus flytrap, and that's her. Mm-hmm. Or a praying mantis. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Okay. Venus flytraps are cuter. Listen to me. Yeah, they are, yeah. <laughs> but the outcome is the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then we get these sections throughout the story, uh, or at least the main storyline about her past. Mm-hmm. Her yeah, and those are different. Her, her mother, her relationship with her mother, her relationship with Jake, the guy right. who cared for her after uh, her mother passed. Yeah, and her her attempted relationship with her father, mm-hmm. and all those things. Yeah, and they're they're colored differently. Like they're black and white, uh, more not black and white, but they're more they're more muted. They're more like. You know, in gray tones. Right? Yeah. So and I appreciate that. I mean, it's, I liked it as a, like you said, it's a, 
I like the act, the idea that it's a novella, that it's a like kind of done in one book, which to me is, you know, I, I like that they're playing around a little bit with what, how they deliver criminal. Um, although I read that they're going to do an ongoing criminal series starting next year. So they're coming back to criminal Single issue series. Right. Huh? So they're going to do, they're going to do that again. Um, and not, not in a finite way, or at least not planned to be finite. Um, so they're, they're coming back to that world, but they're, they're going to do it kind of like an anthology style where one issue might be about one character and be self-contained and then maybe another storyline will last two or three issues and it'll jump around. That's, that's what I read um, that they're planning to do. Um, so it's going to be a, a different take on it maybe. And I kind of appreciate that these guys have been working that long and they're, you know, they're, they're taking chances. They're working in a, in a genre and with characters that they love and have developed. And, you know, I'm like, good for them. And good for us because I really like reading those that particular series. Like you said, it's got a it's got a special place in my I don't know my fandom. I'm not gonna say heart, maybe heart. I don't know. Yeah, they have a special place in my heart. I'll say it as well. <laughs> and um, I'm curious to hear now. You know, I, I'm lousy at keeping up with comics news, mm-hmm. unfortunately, and I, sh- I should be better. You know, given the fact that you know I do the <laughs> podcast. Um, but I didn't know that there was going to be a new single issue series of criminal. I was hoping that with my heroes have always been junkies, we would get maybe in the future, if there were additional criminal narratives that they would be complete. In other words, they would hold on to things until they were done instead of coming out with single issues and then collecting them first in trades and then deluxe editions. You know, maybe that's too idealistic. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I say that just because I've steered away from single issues now over the past several years, right? Um, you know, for, for for both financial and also time reasons. Mm-hmm. So I usually wait until something is collected. So a moment ago when I said, you know, kill or be killed, I'm waiting for the deluxe edition to come out. Well, yeah, I'm waiting for the complete deluxe edition uh, to come out of that, but. Um, but this now I'm reading this from a PDF. Do you have a hard copy or are you looking from a PDF? I have a hard copy. Okay. It, it is hardback, right? It is. Nice. It is. Nice. See, my, mine is in the mail or, well, figuratively speaking, mm-hmm. uh, cause I got mine. I ordered mine from my online comic shop, discount mm-hmm. comic book service. I highly They're good. recommend. <laughs> They're very good people. Yes, they are. Um, so, See, we don't just have them as sponsors. I use them. But mm. um, so, yeah, I'm waiting for mine to come. But uh, in the meantime, I'm reading from a PDF. My comic shop had it. So I was like, I'm going to buy that right off the rack. Good for you, my friend. Hey, that's, that's how we roll here. <laughs> and for the record, Killer Be Killed is not a TV series. It's going to be a movie, supposedly, that's being developed by the director of the John Wick series. Mm. So you, I think after John Wick, they're going to go to kill or be killed. Interesting. So Brubaker now, and Phillips movie. Okay. Over the weekend, I was listening to another podcast that I listen to on a fairly regular basis. Mm-hmm. And they were, I think, much more briefly than we have been doing, discussing my heroes have always been cow, uh, junkies. I about mm-hmm. to say cowboys. <laughs> you started and, singing a few bars of it. Yeah. <laughs> And one of the things they had mentioned is that not only with this, but even with some previous criminal stories, that Mm. they feel that they may get Brubaker Phillips fatigue. And I've never experienced that. And I'm curious if that's a phenomena you've ever experienced. To me, it seems like I, I it might just be the way I read comics. Like you said, like some things I do trade weight. And so I don't get them all at once. And when I do get them, sometimes I read them in a clip and sometimes I, you know, I, I just parse them out and I've never read their stuff in a way that like, I tend to read the entire narrative. Like I bought the fade out in, in trades. So I didn't get the, 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 the big one, but I got the three little ones and I just read it that way. So every six months or so, I just picked up on the was story. It three again. or two little ones or trades. It was three. Cause it was, so uh, the fade, out? It was a, the fade out. Yeah. The fifth, the fade out was, uh, it was 15 issues, so it was three oh, fives. Oh, okay. And so, you know, I, I like reading it in kind of that chunk, um, which is, is kind of weird. I know that there's these really nice 
versions. Um, but I tend to read the, the, the smaller floppy versions, if that makes sense. Like the ones that come out first, the, the, the right, initial the trades. trades. Yeah. Yeah. I read those and, you know, and I tend to, I let them stack up usually. And then I, you know, I, I, I rip through them when I have some time. Um, but I, you know, I read the fade out. I read the fade out pretty much all three trades in one, you know, not one sitting, but, you know, kind of in one time period. Um, so I don't know. It's I could see if you had a lot of it, but I also, you know, I try to be well, I right now I don't have I would say I try to be judicious with my time. But right now it's like, you know, little people don't let me have a lot of time. So it's like when I get comics, I'm like. I want them to be good comics that are worth my time. And with them, I I generally feel that that's what they're going to be on the front end. And I haven't been disappointed thus far. And so whatever length of time I, I, you know, I, uh, I lay out is it's working for me. I mean, I can see, I guess if you read it all the time or monthly, um, but maybe binged on it. Yeah, perhaps. But even then, I don't know. I I don't, because I think with m- some of the criminal stuff, there were times that I did binge on it, but mm-hmm. I I never got tired of it. Maybe an associated associated question is, do you think that the figure of Ellie in My mm-hmm. Heroes Have Always Been Junkies is a little – how do I put this? Too much. In other words, not only a little too predictable in the kind of person that she is, but mm-hmm. also is not as complex as she could be. I mean, I think she's I think she's a three-dimensional character. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. What what do you think? I mean, I think in the space of this book, she's not as developed as she could be, and I I do think that. Um but I there's a part of me that hopes that she's one of the ones that they revisit. You know, like you never get the complete, I mean, one of the things that's nice about the series is that most people, I mean, some people, some people die at the end of these things. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I I won't spoil things too, too much maybe, but I hope that, well, even if they do die, sometimes you get flashbacks to them and, and, and you kind of learn about their back history. So Mm -hmm. I won't spoil anything about what happens to Ellie, but I think that, you know, they are, good about revisiting characters with potential and they don't always say everything about somebody and then kind of, they fill in things on the back end. And I'm hoping she's a character like that. Um, cause I, I think she's got a lot of potential cause for complexity, like you said, she's a little, you know, in the space of this, it's kind of less, less so. Yeah. Um, But I want her to be sympathetic. That's my thing with the book is that that's, that's kind of how it hit me. Like I wanted to root for her like Mm -hmm. the whole book. And even when things kind of turn in different directions and, you know, you, you, you kind of learn some things. Um, but, you know, I think it's to me, the book is good that way because it's 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 like that kind of good noir to me that's n- manipulative and lets you see like these really horrible things about pretty much anybody. Um, right. And I, I, I appreciate that. And that's one of the things that I liked about the book is that I felt it it twisted and turned enough times to be satisfying, even though it's, it's it's like, it's a novella. It's not the longest book in the world. Um, I think it it, it worked that way because the first third you could read almost literally. And then after that, it kind of starts doing some things. Yeah. Um, You're right. I mean, if this were, let's say a five issue or six issue issue series, mm -hmm. then we would probably get more of Ellie fleshed out, so to speak. And, and yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, not being obscene here <laughs> by talking about fleshing out Ellie. Uh, but we have, I guess, given the length of this, in essence, what is about three issues? Yeah, I was going to say that. I'm looking at the binding and it, the way it's bound together. It's like three little, you know, even chunks, uh, mm-hmm. you know, through the spine. So it's yeah, it's about three issues. Mm-hmm. Which you know, uh, the, in, maybe they had that story and image was like, well, if it was longer. <laughs> You know, it'd be a limited series if it, you know, but maybe it, if it was shorter, it'd be a one shot. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of in the middle the way the way they want to tell it. Yeah, I, I think what we have here of Ellie is enough, and mm-hmm. maybe we'll get more of her in subsequent criminal narratives. One thing that I really appreciated about my heroes have always been junkies is that it ends as it begins. In other words, she's mm-hmm. at the beach, right? Yeah, and I like that. Like, thematically, it was satisfying, um, and just 
in terms of the narrative, I think it works. Um, and yeah, not to say what happens, but it, it, yeah. And I'm not giving anything, well. right. And I'm not giving anything away here in the first at the very beginning of the book in that beach scene. She seemed much more upbeat and positive mm-hmm. in the last scene of the book. I can't say that. And in fact, if you look at that very last page, the very last panel, when she's basically looking not directly at us, the reader, but looking off into the you know at, at the horizon, mm-hmm. um, the expression on her face tells me something different. Oh yeah, yeah. It's I'm not going to say nihilist, but something like that. It's um, yeah. It's 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 not as upbeat as it was at the beginning. No, and she's – I think it's one of those things too. Like reading it, you kind of want her to kind of – or at least I did. I wanted her to kind of – you know, I bought into the thing and it's like I want you to kind of be like this troubled ingenue. Yeah. You know, and then you know, the more you get into the book, the more you know she's not that. Um, and you know, maybe that's her – that's her face. That's that's like – that's one of the powers of this book to me I think and the, this team. Because, you know, oftentimes, you know, the writer gets the credit for all this stuff, for Mm -hmm. conveying the emotion or, you know, telling the story or, you know, framing it or plotting it. But, you know, that that last panel, Phillips is like it's devastating in a way. And it kind of tells you, you know, this has been the whole book. You just chose not to see that or Mm -hmm. we chose not. You know, she was showing a a different thing. That's a good point. Yeah. So, you know, to me, that has a lot of impact. Um, You know, I think Phillips is one of those. He's very subtle as a as an artist, I think, um, because you know a lot of these, you know, the, it's it's easy to read comics sometimes and look at it and kind of take for granted. You're like, oh, these are just regular people wearing regular clothes in regular places, and they're just having conversations and things are going on. It's like nothing fancy, right? But mm-hmm. Phillips, I don't know, he, his art style, he he gets a lot of emotion. I think he's got a lot of uh, he's got a really good economy of art like he he can portray a lot of complex and even like one panel like that mm-hmm. without any words um he's just he, he nails those images yeah exactly uh another thing i enjoyed about this is the fact that we get a couple of panels of jean-paul sartre yeah <laughs> and the crabs something for everyone in this book yeah <laughs> and, so, and and uh what a couple of beautiful panels that depict uh van gogh Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. In a way, it kind of reminded me in a not entirely, but uh, marbles in a way like that character in uh, Ellen Forney's marbles. who's kind of like that romanticized, you know, like in her book, it's like romanticizing people who have mental illnesses and hers. It's like, you know, Ellie's, you know, romanticizing these junkies, you know, drug addicts and Mm -hmm. kind of revisiting that like, I'm, you know, tonally or, you know, she's got a lot of Graham Parsons in here. Yeah. And. To and me, that see Graham part. I mean, most of these celebrities that she mentions, mm-hmm. she mentions, and that's it. But there are a few that we see in right. Graham Par- Parsons. There's a section where we do see him. Yeah, and that's I don't know. I I thought it had a lot going on. Like at the very beginning, we talked about how the it being branded as it is or titled as it is, and like you don't know it's a criminal book until you get into it. Um, you know, uh, this is a book that. Uh, you know, part of why I know that there's a series is because I went and did a little digging on this because uh, you know, on my blog, I review books. And this is one of the ones I have set up in the queue to, to, to drop. And uh, I always look at other people's reviews to kind of, you know, find some quotes or something like that. And one of the ones that struck me, they they, they panned the book, but they didn't pan the book for what the book was. Who, the, the reviewer? The, the reviewer, yeah, panned the book, but was like, I wanted a lot more context about the junkies and you know her mental state and why she romanticizes them you know and she wanted they, they were like we, we should have more information about junkies <laughs> and it struck me as kind of like well it's a crime book but you know i i know it as a crime book because i know the series and i know the context but this reviewer was like well it's promised junkies and i didn't get junkies i didn't get enough about junkies <laughs> what the hell that's what i thought and i was like eh, i think know. she provides Definitely enough information as to why she romanticizes these junkies. Yeah. It threw me too. I was like, I mean, you know, did you just read the book and write the review like <laughs> in one sitting? <laughs> like, that's kind of what I thought. Like, you didn't think about the book at all. Eh. Reviewers. Like, eh. 
I know. We're just, I mean, uh, not we, they, they. <laughs> they yeah. <laughs> okay, let's get to the third text that we're going to be looking at for this week, and that is Umbrella Academy, Hotel Oblivion, number one, by Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba. This is coming out, or has come out this month, from Dark Horse Comics. Mm-hmm. And, Sturge, you and I were talking before we turned on the microphones about our previous experiences mm-hmm. with Umbrella Academy. And by the way, this is, I think, arguably a superhero narrative, but mm-hmm. because it's not from the big two, we can talk about it. And it's a weird, it's a weird superhero narrative. It, it, yeah, uh, very, very, very weird. Um, you know, kind of on the level, I guess the DC equivalent would be a uh, dial H for hero or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but anyway, we were talking and we were sharing our experiences. You and I are going to be coming from this discussion or coming mm-hmm. in our discussion from two different perspectives because you are familiar. You've read all of the um, umbrella Academy narratives, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the previous apocalypse suite and then Dallas, whereas mm-hmm. I hadn't before I read hotel oblivion. Number one. Which made me very curious because I want to know what this was like for you to read it with no context because I thought it was very different from the prior series in in, in a lot of ways. So what what you know did you know what was going on? At first, no. Now, now let me say I did years ago start reading Umbrella Academy Apocalypse Suite, but then mm. stopped after the first issue or two. Not because I didn't like it. It's just because I had competing things going on at the time mm-hmm. um, and just never picked it back up. But my first experience – okay, I read through – the first time I read through Hotel Oblivion number one, I was confused. I was mm-hmm. trying to make sense of things. It was like I was treading narrative water. Right. Okay. Um, and then what I did is I didn't go back and read Apocalypse Suite in Dallas, but I, you know, took the cheater's way and I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> this, is the second way. T- this is the second time the Wikipedia has come up in our discussion. Hey. And I read, and those descriptions aren't complete, but at least they are skeletal in terms of who certain characters are and what's happened before. But even those descriptions were a little scattered and confusing to some degree, I think, on Wikipedia. But mm-hmm. anyway, I got a little more context, and then I went back and reread Hot- Hotel Oblivion number one. Mm-hmm. Um, understood it a little more, but this is one of those series, I think, whether you've known the previous Umbrella Academy stories or not – that things will start to come together as we get into the series. So by mm-hmm. issue three and four, I think things will make more sense. Yeah, I can see that. I think it's, uh, you know, I come from it in a different way and I'm, I'm going to admit, I, I know I've talked before about, you know, in the basement, I got four or five, uh, you know, tr- short boxes of comics that I haven't gotten to that I've been well-meaning to get to. And the Dallas series, the, the middle series, is one of those series that, you know, I had all six issues down there. So I went and – I'm not going to say I, I'm a good – you know, I get a gold star for doing my homework this weekend. But I went and got those <laughs> six and caught up. And one of the things that struck me about those six issues of Dallas, which kind of goes through uh, – you know, the, the setup here is that there are um, seven people – who were raised by this, you know, kind of like, uh, like in doom patrol, there's the chief, you know, like the scientist guy with a beard, who's, you know, mysterious and, uh, um, you know, has, has ulterior intentions. So this, this guy raises these seven kids and all of them have superpowers except for one, um, which and that's I would Hargreaves, throw. right? Yes. Hargraves. Uh, what's his name? Reginald. I think Reginald Hargraves. Reg- yeah. Reginald Hargraves. Yeah, he's the, he's the he's the I'm doing air quotes again, the dad. I mean, because he raises them and trains them, but he is cold and not emotionally available to any of them. Like basically he's 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 a jerk who just happens to be like, you better appreciate everything I have. Plus, you have superpowers and I'm going to train you to, 
use them. And they're all very different personalities. And, you, you, you know, I won't spoil what happens. I mean, if you read the first issue, I mean, not the, fir- the first series, you kind of learn, you know, what the deal is with the one who doesn't have powers. Um, but they have a dysfunctional relationship. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Mm. And they kind of operate kind of like BPRD, maybe in a way like okay. the, gov- the government comes to them when they have like a really weird problem or something that they can't cope with. And they get the family, like the dad gets the family to take care of the problem, whatever that is. And so they're, they're like little kids doing this and then they all kind of grow up. And then the, the series picks up with them as like adults and the father has died at the very front end of the, the first series. And it's kind of like how they, uh, they've all kind of gone their own ways. So it's like how they all reconnect. And then, you know, that's, it's like superhero, ish and you know like they've gone through some life changes like one of them has uh he's lost his body he's I like it. he's getting decapitated but he's transferred his body to like a giant ape body so he's got like this little tiny little little boy head is that luther a, yeah yeah luther is uh space is, is, boy space boy right he's called space but that's his roommate you know but he's like uh he's he's got an ape body and a little tiny head on top and he's got like a pew pew laser gun that he you know he shoots the hell out of things with um and so, you know, it's like there's these, 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 you know, and they all have different powers, which, you know, some of them are, you know, one of them's the rumor. And, you know, she says, I heard a rumor that whatever she says, like happens. And, you know, it's like very, you know, it, it's like she can warp reality and things like that. Um, so it's kind of, it's got a lot of elements going on. It's like superhero ish, but it's got like the family dynamics it's got kind of these fantastical sci-fi elements to it that are, you know, I think a little bit more than a typical superhero comic does, at least contemporary superhero comics. Um, it's kind of in the vein of like, like, like Grant Morrison, Doom Patrol, which, you know, Gerard Way did uh, the Doom Patrol for the, the That's new right. animal series. So they're kind of like, it smacks of that in a way mm-hmm. to me too. Um, but it's got the family dynamic to it. And so there's that. The Dallas series is more helpful to me because the first inside flap of the cover had all the characters laid out in different novel ways, but it always reminded you who was who and what they could do and kind of what the relationships were and how the story was progressing. Like that helped in a way that this doesn't at least so far, because the first issue doesn't have any, like you, if you didn't know who the characters are, there's nothing laying out the characters until you read the story. And you know, to me, that was not, I mean, it was immediately, you know, a, a noticeable difference. And the first, you know, Dallas came out in 2008. So I hadn't read that in a, you know, it sat there for a while and it ended in 2009. So there's been a big gap between that and this. So to me, I always thought like, you know, it'd have been nice if there was something recapping things, but you know, now, nowadays we have Wikipedia and people have trades and, you know, maybe, you know, they, 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 they catch up that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I still I got into the series and for me, it was like I just picked up right after the last series. So it was like, you know, a lot more immediate. Um, but I still think I will say this. I don't think it's as tightly plotted as the prior the Dallas series for sure. And uh, Apocalypse Suite, that one either. I don't think it's it, it, this to me seems a little bit more decompressed in terms of storytelling. Um, and maybe it's just, you know, it's like checking in. Yeah. It's, it's much more decompressed. Like it's not, you know, I think things are spread out. Like we're kind of getting the seeds of things and, you know, we're kind of checking in with characters and where they are. There's not a lot of context. I think about them all the time. Like if you hadn't read the last book, like maybe you wouldn't know why they are doing what they're doing or, you know, why the white violin is in physical therapy or why the eight body suddenly has a beard and looks like an old person. Okay, this is time so the, wo- okay, so the the woman who is in physical therapy is the yes. violin. Okay, she's white. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, she's the white violin. It's, it's a spoiler. She's the one who doesn't have powers. Okay, that you learn in the first series has all the powers, and right. he suppressed them so that she couldn't destroy everybody. Okay, one question that I have is: this is toward the last quarter of this issue. We get a one pager with a young woman on a bus in Wisconsin, 
and the bus, I guess, either hits the deer or mm-hmm. comes across a deer that's been hit. Um, this seemed to be out of context of everything else that I was reading, and I didn't know what to make of that. Yeah, I'm not sure either. You want the truth. Things could always have been. I don't know what that is. You want the truth. To me, that might be a. That might be like a setting up whatever the bad thing is going to be. Like there's just a page. It's like a breadcrumb for something because I don't recognize that character. She doesn't. She's not one of the sisters. As far as I can tell. Yeah, I didn't think she was. And this is uh, something else that leads me to the suggestion that I made earlier is that this is one of those series or limited series, I guess, in this case, Mm -hmm. that it certain things will begin coming together once you mm -hmm. get further in. Sure. And I think I think I agree with you. I mean, having read the Dallas series, it was like that, too, because they they introduce all these these crazy things and time travel. And so you end up with like multiple versions of some of these characters in the prior series. Uh So to me, it's like they're going to tackle some complex stuff and do some twisting and turning plot wise. It's just that we don't know what it is yet. And I agree with you, like as a first issue. As somebody who's a fan of the series, I like I like this issue because it's kind of like I'm checking in with them again. But as if I was a new reader to this, I would be I would there would be a lot that I would not have context for and I wouldn't really know what was happening. But I still I I, I mean, I'm in for it just because of that. But I might trade weight on this one more so than I have the other series because the other series I bought all the issues. Hmm. So you say you are going to trade weight on this? I might. I'm kind of in, in, you know, the same. I buy comics. They sit in a box. So if I buy a trade, I tend to read the trades. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, there's one day I'm going to catch up. That's that's my <laughs> one uh, day. One of these that's days. Right. That's right. One of, one of these days I'll read all the books that are on my shelf. But there's a word for that that I don't remember the word. It's not it's not in our language. I think the Japanese have a word for you know, buying books and not reading them. <laughs> Delusional. Delusional. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I enjoyed this. I, I, I'm definitely going to trade weight on it, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also need, I, I do have, I think somewhere packed away some, I don't know if all earlier issues of the umbrella Academy, I just mm-hmm. have to find them and, and read them. Um, Now, I read somewhere that this being the follow up to Dallas is something that was projected to have come out beginning in 2010. Mm -hmm. But then he held on to it. Then he had uh, Gerard Way. Then he had the the Killjoy series. Right. In what? 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he was supposed to go back to music. But then we know what happened with the the young animal line. Young animal. Yeah. So new animal. Yeah. Did I say new animal? I think I said new animal. Young animal is right. Young animal. Yeah. Maybe if they bring back young animal, it'll be new animal. That's right. New, new young animal. So this is something that has been a long time in coming and fans of the Umbrella Academy narratives uh, have uh, been eagerly awaiting. Mm -hmm. Plus there's a Netflix series coming out based on the series. That's right. Beginning of the, what, February of next year. Yeah. And I think, well, um, look, Ellen Page is going to be in it. And I mean, she's the big name person. Mary J. Blige is going to be in it. Hmm. So yeah, that's, so that that'll be something. It'll be on Netflix, and maybe it'll. It's it's certainly interesting, like to me. It's like a fascinating set of stories, and I'm kind of intrigued to see kind of how it works out. I don't know if there's trailers or anything for it yet, but it kind of struck me as maybe that's the timing of this too. Like it's been on the back burner, and now it's like, well, do something with it. <laughs> that's right. Put out a new trade. <laughs> mm. So, but I'm, I'm I also look forward to it because. You know, Gerard Way, you know, he doesn't have a lot of comics to his credit, but I've enjoyed the ones of his I've read. And Gabriel Ba is like one of my favorite creators. So oh, yeah. I'll read pretty much anything he does. Um, and so, you know, to me, it's like, you know, a couple like weirdly inventive people. I mean, weirdly in a good way, like like, the, you know, the, the stuff is kind of off kilter and not typical. So I like I like their takes on things. So it's like a like I said, it's like a weird 
BPRD superhero with little kids book. <laughs> I don't know how to describe that. It's kind of like I remember the first series kind of reminded me a little bit of those unfortunate series of incidents books because like the way the series family kind of unfortunate did. events. That's the one, the Lemony Snicket books, just because of how the, the characters like, you know, how the kids all kind of relate to each other. Like there was mm-hmm. something about it that had that kind of flavor to it to me anyway. So it was kind of like a like a, a mixture of a whole lot of different stuff or genre. I don't know. It's like a multi genre work. Like it touches on a lot of things, but I like it. I'm I'm in for the trade. Good. Well, Sturge, we looked at three really interesting books for this week. We started off with uh, DC Comics Before Superman, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson's Pulp Comics by Nikki Wheeler Nicholson. After that, we checked out Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips's My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies. And then we concluded the show with Umbrella Academy Hotel Oblivion Number 1 by Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba. Yeah, that's a that's quite a trip we took this week. It was, it was, and uh, I enjoyed reading those. And if you enjoy reading great books like this, then you darn well better check out the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice dot com, and there you'll find a whole slew of deals every single month. That's dcbservice dot com. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about this week's show. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up your phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Or you can email us. I'm Sturge at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at ComicsAlternative.com, or you can contact both of us at Two Guys at ComicsAlternative.com. And we're all over social media. Check out our accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, on TuneIn, and on iHeartRadio. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to the website, comicsalternative.com. We're everywhere. Yes, and we're everywhere because we like to hear from you. So use your communicative means of choice and reach out and touch. That's right. I'll sing the song. Well, next time I'll sing the song. What was that? Um... What product was that the jingle for? Reach out. I'll say. Oh, it was, reach it out was, and touch someone. That was, uh, it was, AT&T? That, was it Bell? Was it AT&T or Bell? It or was Bell. It was, that's right. Might have been. That's right. It was about long distance. Yeah. That reaches back to our childhood. Hey, that's it's the good old days when telephones were expensive and, and fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Sturge and I will be back next week for our special annual Halloween episode. And one of the things we like to do on the Comics Alternative on the regular weekly show especially is to look at either Halloween specials for the current year or horror titles that are recent. In other words, we like to participate in the Halloween spirit of things. That's right. It's going to be spooky. (laughs) And you knew he would say that. You knew he would say that. Yeah. And as fate would have it this year, Wednesday, which is when the show comes out, falls on uh, October 31st. All Hallows Eve. That's right. So good timing. That's right. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Sturge. Take care. Welcome. No, that's the backwards. (laughs) Farewell. (laughs)
Hey, what happened?